Welcome to the Research Directions podcast, which brings researchers from different fields together to answer really important questions. This podcast is produced on behalf of Cambridge University Press and sponsored by the McAcherin Institute in Canada. Today, we will be exploring the One Health question, is there an ideal curriculum and pedagogy to achieve an optimal One Health practitioner capable of contributing to the growing expectations for One Health? My name is Martin Delahunty, and I will be your host. My guests are Craig Stephen, Executive Director at the McAcherin Institute, and Professor Richard Koch, Editor-in-Chief of Research Directions One Health. A very warm welcome, Craig and Richard. Nice to see you, Martin. Good, good to be here. To begin, could I ask you, Craig, to give the background to objectives and uniqueness of the McAcherin Institute and also the reasons for sponsoring the Research Directions One Health question. I'd be happy to do that, Martin. So the McEachern Institute is, uh, maybe I'll say, a neonatal nonprofit organization in Canada. Certainly in North America, it's one of, if not the first think tank that's dedicated to challenging some of the questions and the status quo around our relationships between animals, people in the world around us. What we were trying to do was build a space where people can spend as much time thinking about the questions as the answers. Building a space where we can bring people together to, to think. We spend an awful lot of time doing, an awful lot of time using methodology, but all good research starts with good questions. And that's one of the reasons this relationship with this journal made a lot of sense. Uh, with the growing expectations for this idea of One Health, we, we need to play a bit of catch up and say, what are we really trying to achieve? So one of our um, uh, charitable priorities in the McEachern Institute is thinking about innovations in education and training. And how do we create people who can bridge that gap between good intentions and, and making change on the ground? So having a journal that is focused on trying to distill and integrate information to deal with this particular question was just sort of a natural partnership. So why, why did you choose that, this particular question on the optimal well health practitioner? Well, personally, as somebody who's worked in this sphere for almost 30 years, I've, I, I always tell my, when I'm talking to students about this, when I'm lecturing students, I, I say that as a veterinary epidemiologist who's worked around this issue of you know, wildlife conservation and climate change and food security, I've spent a career doing two things. First is being a retrospective genius. As an epidemiologist, the signal is often the bad thing. And then you come in and explain the bad thing and I investigate the bad thing and describe the bad thing rather than working forward. And secondly, much of what we do is document demise. We watch it, we measure it, we monitor it, we surveil it. And, and having worked in this area and seeing that we're at a fundamental change uh, in social structures and ecological structures that are accelerating the, the, the risks to humanity and to wildlife, to animals, describing what has happened and why is no longer acceptable. So we do need to rethink how we train people to be future ready, which is another primary function of the McEachern Institute, is how do we create and support future ready animal health professionals. Training the same way we've got uh, that got us into this situation is not a future ready strategy. So thinking about innovations in pedagogy and training is, is, is essential at this sort of just um, transition time for One Health. Uh, can I turn now to, to Richard as editor in chief uh, for Research and Directions One Health. Can you talk about the importance and the role of the journal in One Health? Yeah, I think Craig has put it very well actually that uh, this is transformative change and for professions that have you know, very sort of, to them, clear mandates that are very siloed, actually, um, you know, within a particular health field, I think we have big challenges, actually, to sort of break those barriers down. So <clears throat> how do we do it? Well, science is meant to be experiment, <laughs> and uh, you evaluate, you know, um, through that experimentation to try and get answers. So. Publishing is a way of us putting out some of these experiments, if you like, um, and to get people to to reflect on them, to review them, to analyze them, um, and then look at their impacts, and then decide whether that actually is the way to go forward. So to me, um, our main publishing <coughs> agencies are critical in this transformative process. Um, scientists tend to read science and uh, so to get scientists to change they have to be convinced so I you know I think this initiative from the Cambridge University Press um, and there are others around 
but are basically looking to achieve trans transformative thinking and then that can be translated into pedagogy. Um, so it's as fundamental as that really. Um, so we have to get change uh, currently with the way institutions are structured, the way our professions are structured. Mostly we can't think outside the box. And can I ask uh, maybe both you, uh, uh, your uh, assumptions around the success metrics for, for the question? So how will you achieve success? So I, 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 wear, I wear two hats, both as, as the um, director at the McEachern Institute, but also as one of the uh, associate editors on the journal. So from the Institute's perspective, success is going to come if we see something different. If we see people fundamentally re-describing, you know, a master's of public health approach or a vet epi approach or a standard approach with just slightly changed wording, that will be disappointing. If we don't see people talking about developing the skills and the capacities to translate evidence into action, that will be disappointing. So I think I, I, want, I want to be able to see some transformative ideas about education that, is, that are percolating up from the community. Um, whether these are proven or hypothesized, supported by evidence, supported by experience, that will inspire people to try something different. To me, that will be a success. To me, that's what I want to see. Wearing my, wearing my editor hat, I want to see people contributing. I want to see people thinking about this seriously. I want to see a number of papers coming in so that we have a breadth of experiences from around the world to try to see what's what's common what's adaptable what might we what might we do as a global community on this issue yeah i think that's that's extremely important and one of my worries in you know is the way the one health uh, process evolves and in many ways it has started with a top down approach in other words you know a few people in a few privileged positions have decided in a sense what the context is what what one health is and it, it, yeah, I understand that, you know, these are the sort of challenges we all have to deal with. But I'd much rather see something that is uh, evolving organically. And in a way, development of pedagogy is part of that process. You know, it's not necessarily that the ideology is fixed. It's about an evolution, really, of what works and, and what actually has impact, ultimately. So it's all these different uh, entities um, around the health um, paradigm. Which, which need to reflect, which need to, you know, help it to, to, to develop, if you like, some of those ideas that then become policy and then become part of the national process. It worries me that already uh, I see documents that go out to national governments saying this is One Health and this is how to do One Health. This is what you've got to do to make One Health work, when actually it hasn't evolved um, as yet um, in a way which is, which is um, going to work. And I, I often use the uh, poorly represented part of One Health, which is environment, ecosystem health, uh, wildlife health, if you like, uh, how, how we bring nature and uh, the systems that uh, underpin, if you like, human health um, and our economy um, into this whole equation. Uh, and it's lip service on the whole by the agencies who don't have a mandate in this area. And we don't have enough of the people who in a sense, have some experience. Um, of course, it's a weaker community than within the human health field or, or even the veterinary field. But I see that as a big challenge. So how do we bring that in? Uh, I think uh, institutes like McCracken clearly can help to find a way for that that's both pragmatic, it works, it, you know, it takes some account of the, the, the different scales, actually, the different uh, competencies and so on between different uh, sectors. And if I could just add on to that, Martin, I think, I think Richard's hit one of the key challenges with this question. Uh, there is not a pedagogy for One Health because there's not a One Health. I mean, there's many healths. And, and, and the challenge that we have, I mean, they, they've said the 21st century is going to be the century of complexity in science. And how do, we, how do we teach that? Because that means there is no single approach to doing this. How do you teach a standard set of competencies and skills that will be non-standard in their application? Right? How do we develop, how do we get people who are adaptive and curious and innovative, as opposed to having 
a set list of checkboxes we go on to. So again, I'm excited to see if we see people attack this question by looking at it in a non-traditional way in, that we have in most of the biomedical sciences that predominate One Health, so that we have an adaptable approach to training that meets communities where they are and what they need, as opposed to, as Richard say, imposing this is what you know thou shalt need to learn. And, and so having a standardized, non-standardized pedagogy will be a big shift for a lot of the education community. And uh, I know, Craig, you're working with uh, other organizations. Could you maybe explain how you collaborate with other organizations to, to advance One Health? Well, what we're trying to do with the McEachern Institute is basically build a community of practice where we approach other folks to work together and how can we be value-added. So what we're really about empowering people to make change. So some of what we do, for example, working with the University of the West Indies is developing a program on climate change and health leadership for the Caribbean and talking about doing that in other countries as well. Uh, so that's a, that's a way where we're trying to not, again, impose an approach on people, but help people identify and discover what works for them. So we have another other, a, a number of other universities that we collaborate with, trying to give unique graduate student experiences where they can explore some of these questions. Sometimes we do them through contractors. Um, so we are, we're agnostic to organization. We ask, given this problem, who needs to be engaged? How do we have to work with? Whether, again, that's at the community level, the university, or the government level. And likewise, R Richard, in terms of your, your work, um, are there collaborations that... you? Know, you're seeing advancing again One Health and, and making a difference. Yeah, look, of course, one has to work uh, with what you've got. So, <clears throat> you know, because there's a very strong uh, human health community in this field, of course, you, you, you work as much as possible to encourage those groups to, to engage. I mean, they're interested in animals, but they see animals very differently to the way, say, a veterinary community sees animals. And uh, a veterinary community sees animals very differently from what a wildlife community sees animals and their relationship with humans and so on. So what's so important, I think, is to identify those communities um, within the health sectors and, uh, you know, try and get a balanced uh, discussion uh, going. It, you know, it, it means that uh, the, the human health community just has to accept that there's uh, a rather weak, uh, poorly represented community that has knowledge about wildlife and the environment um, that's not so well schooled in uh, bringing forward uh, you know, health issues from that side of things into the debate and into the human environment. So I, I, I think it's uh, identifying uh, those communities. And I, I would say that it's beyond science, actually. It really is beyond science. So, you know, it's looking at even indigenous communities. So we're trying, I mean, within the wildlife frame, actually, we we tend to have a closer association with, with things like communities because um, wildlife is embedded in communities. Domestic animals are, uh, yes, embedded in communities where they're, they're, they're pets, uh, but actually nowadays uh, farm, farm animals are mostly embedded in corporations, actually. They're not embedded in, in communities at all. Um, you can have these you know, massive industries in the middle of cities that nobody even knows are there and have, have no contact with. So it's these sorts of challenges. And, and I think, you know, the different sectors have strengths. And so how to, to broaden, um, you know, our perceptions around health, um, you know, beyond the conventional side is, is, is the key. And that's why bringing in disciplines, uh, more social science disciplines and so on, and uh, anthrop anthropological uh, skills, you know, in bringing uh, cultural knowledge, cultural histories around health, um, you know, ways of doing things. And that, to me, is, is part of our job, really, is, is to incorporate knowledge, you know, from a very much wider sector than the one that, you know, has tended to uh, be associated with One Health. And what's interesting right now in this time of history, it's, it's, I mentioned earlier it's a different time in history because of the scale and rate of changes that we're seeing. But it's also different in terms of the, the, the up-and-coming set of researchers and practitioners. I mean, there's always been people who are passionate about trying to make the world a healthier place. But I, in, the, in the people I interact with now, there's a greater desire to make a change, 
to not just document it, not just know in finer and finer detail the mechanisms of harm before we do something. So I've got, we've got a project right now working with the Canadian federal government that's asking the question, how can federal researchers be disruptive? And, and, and the fundamental underlying premise that, that when we have our interviews with people is they want to see what they learn, what they know, be used and be used for change and be used for positive outcomes. And so that is a really important, again, when we're thinking about how we train people and what are the pedagogical elements that people need to know. Do we need to focus more on creating skills so they can be knowledge translators or knowledge generators? I mean, when I went through my doctor work, I see Richard nodding there as well. We were told how to do good science, not how to use good science. And, and there's a growing expectation both of the, at the researcher level, but also at the um, decision maker level for better evidence-based decision making. And so again, another really timely reason for this question to, to, be, to be out and being discussed. And uh, when we talked previously, you, you, you uh, talked about creating space for curiosity and innovative thinking. So what, how do you actually facilitate that at the, at the Institute? Well, one of the things we do is we hold what we call dialogues where we'll identify six, 10, 12 good thinkers on a topic. Good thinkers, there's many good thinkers, but people who we know are open to discussion. There's no agenda, there's no time in that we must produce something, but we bring people together for serious conversations. You know, what do you think is the issue here? What do you think could be the game changer? And those dialogues play a couple of roles. They help give us some strategic direction as an institution of what we might want to focus on to be more effective in inspiring change. But to date, all the participants have gone, I'm thinking about this differently. And that is one of our major success indicators, is that people are thinking about this differently. And so our dialogues so far have been, have been successful. And again, with this collaboration with Cambridge University Press, we're hoping to hold a, a webinar, again, as an excuse to bring people together. It's it, it certainly, in my experience, it's very, very difficult to get research funding to bring people together to think. To plan, yes, you can get money to plan a project and plan a proposal, but to come back and actually ask, is this the right proposal to make? There isn't the space to do that. And that was one of the ideas of the genesis of the, of the Institute, is making that space for people to think. I think, the, I think it's absolutely critical. You know, we, we know in the world we live in uh, what the challenges are for change. I mean, it's, uh, you know, we, we're, you know we're, we're, we're living with COP28 at the moment. And I don't know what's going to happen tonight, but it's a, it, it, change doesn't happen easily. I mean, and, you know, it's, it's years and years of process and, and getting people to think differently. We have to have institutions. I've always said this. You can't convert WHO or this, the new animal WAHO institution into a One Health uh, system. You can't because they are the whole structure, their whole way of thinking, their policy, everything is oriented to what their mandates were. They have shifted to some extent, but still, you push them too far, and you know, a bit like the, the COP situation, you start pushing people whose entire income is based on oil into making a decision that's gonna make the world healthier, they'll choose the opposite, because it's short term. You know, the, their survival is short term. It's not, you know, they don't really worry about what happens in three generations time. So I think this is the, the nub of it with, uh, with One Health is, is, is quietly influencing people to recognize that our future, you know, well-being and our, our future wealth really depends on keeping a healthy uh, environment, keeping a healthy uh, communities, populations, insects, <laughs> people. You know, it, we're all in the same boat, frankly, and um, unfortunately, we've tended to think only of of nature as our resource to exploit, and that it's a sort of you know infinite resource. We now know it's not, and uh, we have to you know rationalise our behaviour. It's easy to talk about, it's easy to intellectualise, but in practice, it's it's a big challenge. So I think we need institutions that are willing to go into that space. Because it's the only way, actually, we'll get those fundamental changes. And ultimately, I think, at national level, we will need new structures, actually. The ones that are more balanced, that give power um, you know, to parts of, if you like, the sectors that will ensure that oil is stopped. You know, I mean, it, it, you know, we have to get to a point where, where there's, there's sufficient power to stop some of these practices. 
that lead to, to so much you know, ill health, really. And uh, uh, Cambridge University Press, with the Research Directions uh, Journal series and we Research Directions One Health, has taken quite, a, in publishing terms, quite a unique and innovative approach to, to setting questions against which then answers are, are submitted. So what, what from, from your perspective, Richard, what kind of response have you had from your editorial board and, and authors who you've talked with to this new approach? Well, I, all I can say, you know, Craig is a good example, is that there are a good, good number of people who, you know, who are not just in this, you know, for some selfish reason or, you know, to, to prove their ego, you know, who, who actually have struggled uh, with this whole business of, of knowledge and how we, you know, how we communicate it, how we educate people. Um, you know, I mean, it's not that we are ideological, it's just, it's a challenge, you know, knowing that we have so many uh, problems to tackle. Um, how, do, how do we move things forward? So, yeah, so I think it's appealing. It's appealing to people who reflect, people who think, how are we going to actually move this whole thing forward? If we are stuck in old uh, publishing um, uh, sort of silos again, um, it, it benefits somebody. I mean, if you, you know, if you invent something new, you get a lot of uh, plaudits, um, you get the money and you can, you know, bring up your family and, and so on. Um, but, but actually, in isolation, these things can be even dangerous and they can actually lead to ill health. So science has, through its, you know, through its narrowness, I guess, um, also created these unintended and unexpected consequences. So we need to pull these together. I think that's, you know, that's evident, uh, particularly in the, in, in the speed at which information now flows around the world, um, how narratives are used and abused. And, uh, you know, we are in dangerous times because, you know, whether it's in the finance sector, whether it's in the health sector, um, if things aren't joined up and if they aren't coordinated and aren't looking for the unintended consequences, we end up in a crisis. Um, and solving a crisis is, is, is not as easy as preventing one. So I think, <clears throat> you know, this is why these systems need to change. So in science, I think the systems, it's not that the fundamentals of science change, evidence is what we want so you have to you know gather the evidence um and there's a point at which you have to say well that's enough evidence for us to make a a, a rational decision it's not that we have to know every single bit because it'll take too long i mean we know that so it's a balance it's trying to get this balance and um and creating a system that is perhaps more transparent less restrictive um you know less dependent on on money um, you know, more dependent on just good ideas and getting them out of there, whether it be from poor communities, rich communities, um, you know, around the world. So, yeah, I, I see there's a very new way of doing things. Like our previous conversation, Martin, we need to put the PH back in PhDs. We, we spend a lot of time creating very, very, very competent and very innovative methodologists in many of our PhD programs, but less time talking about philosophy, thinking, ideas. It will be innovative ideas that will help us more than innovative technology. So, you know, this is again why we have a journal, I think, that's encouraging thinking, you know, the international community to think about this thing, these sort of things, is, is a unique and helpful contribution. I'm gonna finish up with a big question, which is in, in 10 years time, where would you like to see One Health be and perceived as? Richard, maybe I'll go to you first. Yeah. I, look, I think, well, although I, I'm not a, I don't like necessarily these big bodies uh, to evolve, but I do think we need new institutions. So, <clears throat> so I, I hope that we can generate more institutions like Craig's. Um, you know, I always like things like the Stockholm in Institute, you know, which was really trying to tackle you know, issues around some of these very big global geophysical um, concerns, you know, resilience. I mean, you know, some people don't like the term, but, it, you know, just trying to, to create communities of people who look at some of these big issues um, and, you know, and get a, a decent frame for future development. Uh, development doesn't stop. I, I don't believe development has an end point. Um, I think it's all about adaptation, actually, to circumstances as they change. 
Um, it's very difficult to predict exactly how a biological system will 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 behave. And and humans are a classic example of that. I mean, there's not a lot of logic in the way humanity has developed. Um, but but we can in, inject more thinking and understanding about the consequences of what we do, uh, which helps and rationalizes decision making, perhaps in the political and the social uh, frame. Um, so, yes, I, I, you know, I think um, in 10 years, I would like to see some institutions that have evolved within this One Health framework, which, which are more balanced. In other words, you know, we begin to think beyond humanity. I'm a, I'm a post-humanist. That's, that's how I like to think. Um, you know, we, we need to be beyond humanity because ultimately our future will depend on all these other things. So, um, you know, move us from the center, if you like, perhaps move environment more to the to, to the middle because, you know, it's it, it's in trouble. So we need to focus more on, you know, we've been very successful with humanity. I mean, we really have in terms of health in so many ways. Uh, and our success is there in the population numbers. Our biology is, you know, is is very dominant, but you know it's fragile. And so, <clears throat> you know, we 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 need a planet to live on. So, if we refocus, uh, put ourselves a little bit on the periphery for a while, and begin to get things back on track, then we can continue to benefit, and you know, and hu humanity can go into a new phase of development. So. I, I would say that, you know, that's what it's about, really, ultimately, um, you know, is, is rebalancing, uh, you know, a, a very unstable planet at the moment. In 10 years, I want there to be no One Health. Now, and let me, let me explain why. In, in my career, I have gone through sustainability, sustainable development, ecosystem health, eco health, conservation medicine, global health, One Health, planetary health. Right. I, 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 if I have time just for a, a quick story. Early in my career, I was asked to be part of a group that was going to try to measure and understand the ecosystem health of a body of water called the Strait of Georgia. So, of course, the first question is, what's, what's the Strait of Georgia? The physical oceanographers came out and said, well, it's between this trench and this seamount. No, 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 no. The chemical oceanographer said, no, it's between this you know, salinity and this temperature gradient. Biological oceanographer said, no, 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 no. It's, it's where this group of fish go and these things live. These are the boundaries. Finally, there was the one old fellow in the back corner who said, look, an ecosystem is just all the things that affect the thing you're interested in. And then when I'm interested in health, and that always stuck with me, what's happening I worry about with One Health now is becoming its own unique silo. We're worried about advocating an approach than solving the problem. So in 10 years, I want to be a collaborative integrated approach to be the norm that doesn't have to have a special name, but it becomes a new business as usual. Yeah, if I can add to that, I, you see, the only reason I have an interest in One Health is because it, it's the most neutral term that has come out of all these things that Craig has mentioned, you know, up to planetary health. One Health is so neutral, it sort of allows you, gives you space, in a sense, to, you know, to not label it eco, not label it, you know, something else right wing, left wing, blue, green. It, it, it's neutrality. So I, I agree if we can keep things neutral um, and keep focusing on health in the broader sense. Um, so, in a, you know, so we, we just get back to health as being a primary focus of human development in the context of, of everything that's around us, including ourselves. Then I think we've achieved, you know, if we could do that in 10 years, well, I'll be extremely happy because I might survive that long to see it. But, you know, but to me, we're talking 100 years, probably. So, you know, we have to be realistic. Thank you both Craig and Richard for a, a fascinating and provoking conversation. Um, we look forward to hearing more about Research Directions One Health and the McEachern Institute. If like the McEachern Institute, uh, there are other organizations like NGOs, interest groups or industry interested in sponsoring any question published in the Research Direction series, they should contact the program manager, Monica Moniz. Her contact information will be in the show notes. But for the moment, again, thank you, Craig and Richard, for a great conversation. I look forward to the next opportunity to chat with you. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Craig. Thank you.